Good morning. How's, uh, what is this, 9.30? How's the 9.30 doing? The last couple of weeks have been a little bit of a whirlwind, so I don't even know what day it is right now. Yesterday afternoon, I was on the way to officiate a wedding, and uh, Josh said earlier that uh, God just requires an open and willing vessel, right? And uh, Pastor Matt called me. I guess he saw that in me. He's like, hey, I'm not going to be there tomorrow. Uh, you're up. I was like, awesome. And so uh, here I am. And today we kick off a brand new series, and uh, I am excited that you're here. Uh, over the last many weeks, we've been diving into uh, what does it look like for people to walk away from their faith? We've been talking about things of hypocrisy, of believing one thing, saying one thing, yet acting another way. We talked about offense. What does it look like for us to be offended and, and essentially begin to question and walk away from our faith? Doubt. These are natural things in life. We talked about relationships and suffering and legalism. It was a powerful series. In fact, I encourage you, if you weren't here over the last uh, five or six weeks, to go back and listen to these messages. Last week, uh, Blaine Bartell was here and spoke an incredible word about deconstructing our faith. See, here's the reality is deconstruction is pretty easy to do. In fact, yesterday in my neighborhood, I was driving around and I came upon this house that was literally being deconstructed. And when you see something like that, it's hard not to look away. You're just fascinated. We're like, holy cow, they are smashing that house, like completely to the foundation. And they begin to, to they had that big claw thing, and they, I don't even know what it's called. I'm not a construction guy. <laughs> and they begin to pick it up and put it in a dump truck. And I just sat there and looked at it. I was like, man, something that once was is no longer. I, I have three sons, and they love to deconstruct things around our home. It's like our entire house is a deconstruction zone. Like that table, the purpose of that table is to be torn apart. I'm like, no, that's not it. But here's the reality is we kind of go through these three phases that I've noticed and kind of begin to realize over the last several years is this first phase is what I would call is orientation. As we first come to know about the gospel message and we're oriented to it and we begin to believe and begin to take steps towards Christ and our faith and walk and grow. Sometimes we do that in community or coming to church on a Sunday morning and then something happens in our life and we begin to go through this phase of disorientation, of deconstruction, and we begin to question everything that you might once believe. It might have even caused us to walk away, and you may be right in the middle of that this morning. Sometimes that's really healthy. Sometimes it can be very destructive in our lives, depending on how long we stay there. Because a lot of times we just want to stay in deconstruction mode. But then we move into this third phase of reorientation. And sometimes we experience something that I call as a revelation of God's love, where you are uh, woken up to something that is completely new and transformative, and you're like, man, I, I never saw God this way in my life, and it is new, maybe for the very first time. And you begin to dive deep into the scripture and deep into community and deep into the things of God, and your complete paradigm of who God is and what he has done for you is completely reshaped and refined. You see, it's a lot like these bricks here on deconstruction mode. Is we, we love the mess. We love the pile. But what it, what it does is we have to eventually, we, we've got to bend down and go to work. And we have to begin to lay the foundation. Blaine talked about this last week is is we have to be precise as we lay this foundation. Sometimes it, it takes measuring and planning, and we begin to build something new, something that is going to last in our lives. But we all love to hear these messages on hypocrisy because it's kind of sexy, and, and it, 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 honestly, it inflates our ego a little bit, right? 
If we say, man, I'm not as bad as that person, so I must be a good Christian. And we begin to build ourselves up a little bit. Nobody wants to hear a message on the gospel. Why is that? Because it's basic. And we tend to say, you know what, I already know that. We've covered that. I don't need to hear that again. You see, it's so much easier to be a critic than to build something that's going to last throughout the course of your life. Here's what the gospel is. It is the foundation of our lives. It is our purpose. It is why you're here this morning. It's why we're gathered here is we've laid out this vision to see our city transformed by the power of the gospel. That's why we gather in this place. That's why in, in January, Pastor Matt rolled out our, really our vision for the future. It, and it's massive. It, it's really even intimidating to communicate it to you this morning. It's to reach 100,000 people over the next decade. Does that mean 100,000 people walking through the doors of City Church? Absolutely not. It means uh, reaching 100,000 people through what we call microchurches. Of you saying, you know what, I'm going to take this and I'm going to go to an area of brokenness in our city, a people group or a place, and I'm going to live there and I'm going to see it redeemed and reformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all have to engage and we all have to play a part. That's what the gospel does in our lives. But here's the reality is we have so many Christians that are just deconstructing and pulling apart their faith, and they're not reconstructing it to something better. Why? Because it's comfortable to live in deconstruction mode. It's comfortable just to hang out. And like I said, it, it, it's almost fascinating to watch at times. See, it takes hard work to rebuild. It takes getting down sometimes on our hands and knees and saying, you know what, I'm going to put in the hard work to reshape my theology and my thinking around the gospel, I will tell you this, for the first five years of City Church, I was deconstructing my faith. I went through one of the most horrific things that I've ever gone through in my life. I, the first year of City Church, my wife left me of 11 years. Rocked my world. You know the only way that I made it through that? is because I had a leader that was willing to offer me grace. I had a community that was willing to lean in into this pile of rubble and say, man, something beautiful could come of that. God wants to do something through that. See, I was disoriented, and I began to reorient myself into the message and surround myself with community. You see, in a chaotic disoriented time, you must return to what is foundational. And over the next five weeks, we're going to lean in to what does it look like to reconstruct our faith centered around these five things as the gospel, as identity, community, mission, and what does it mean to be spirit empowered. The gospel is this, is being liberated by understanding the good news of what God has done for you in and through Jesus. Identity, becoming whole and healthy as you flourish in a secure, God-given identity. Here's what I've discovered more than, than any other time in my life over the last three years. Of, we've taken over 100, 100 people through our city leadership academy. Identity is one of the greatest things that I see people struggling, struggling with. Not having their identity deeply rooted in the things of God. And, and it's deeply rooted in the things of, of this world, honestly. Their, your, the, our eyes are on other things. And not centered on the gospel message and the things of God. It's community. Belong to and participate in radically loving, formative relationships. That alone has completely transformed my life. Mission. Find purpose and vision in joining God's restorative work in the world. And number five is spirit empowered. Is learning to rely and experience the power of God's spirit within you. 
when you accept that gospel message, when you welcome Christ to be in your life, to be your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in and begins to reside in your body, and you are spirit-empowered to go and walk and live this out. Over the past month or so, our staff has been reading this book by John Tyson and Susie Silk called Kingdom Values. In fact, we, we wrote this book uh, several months ago, and uh, our kingdom foundations are exactly what Susie and John wrote about. This book is practical, it's theological, and it's powerful. And here's, here's what we've done. We, we bought uh, over 100 of these books for you. And so if this is something that you want today, we actually have it for sale in the, lo- or in the outdoor lobby, not in the lo- indoor lobby, the outdoor lobby for $10 today as a gift to you. And I encourage you to pick it up, to read it. Have discussions around it. If you're married, have discussions around that with your, with your wife. If you're dating somebody, have discussions around it with the person that you're dating. If you're in a community, have discussions around this book and that community. I promise you it will be formative in your life. It will be transformative. See, the first priority of the kingdom of heaven is the announcement of of the gospel, the good news of salvation. Paul in Romans 1, we find him giving his great theological discourse, and he says these words are so beautiful. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteousness, the righteous will live by faith. Paul is announcing that something has shifted, something radical has changed in his life, and he is bringing something new. See, Paul is announcing what God had done in and through Jesus. His life had been completely transformed. And he's saying, how, how can we begin to live in this? We're talking about Christ, Christ's death and his victory over sin, his victory over Satan and hell. To those who are living in bondage and sin under the law, this was a message of hope and freedom. It brought life and restoration and redemption. And here's the beauty of the gospel is it is for everyone whether you like them or not. I was a student pastor for over 15 years, and I would continually look at my teenagers, and I would tell them, I say, you don't have to like them, but you have to love them. Did you know that? You don't have to like your neighbors, but you have to love them. That's what we're called to. That's what Paul was saying is this gospel. Imagine this morning with me that you discovered a completely free cure for all types of cancer. Imagine that for a second. How little would you care what people said about you? You see, here's the joy of that is you would have the joy of seeing terminally ill patients being set free and healed from the, really the greatest sickness that we've ever seen is cancer. Would you worry about criticism? Absolutely not, because it would bring incredible joy and delight to your heart. You see, Paul remained energized and unconcerned about human opinion. Why was that? Because the gospel is too wonderful and compelling to disregard. What is the gospel? I'm glad you asked that this morning. It's a great question. It's a proclamation of good news. It's a proclamation of good news. Has you ever met somebody that was so excited and filled with good news that it's just like bursting out of them? My, my friend, Andrew Sledge, is down here. It's like, man, if the Sooners win, I know, like, Andrew's coming to find me. He's going to be telling me. He's like, dude, did you see that? I'm like, I actually didn't. I didn't watch the game. But he's going to tell me. Why is that? Because he's excited about that. It brings joy to his heart. It's the same thing if, if you begin to date someone. And you're like, man, I, I think I met the one. I think she's it. You've been there? 
What about you find a new job or, and you announce it on LinkedIn? I, I've seen lots of these over the last several weeks. It's like, man, you're excited. Everyone's liking that. Everyone's commenting. That. Congratulations. Way to go. You're going to kill it. What about when you are expecting a new child? I never forget when my wife came to me and she said, hey, we're, we're pregnant. And that joy that excited me, there was also terror there too of like, holy cow, I'm, I'm going to be responsible for somebody now. But there, you can just see it in their face. They can't hold it in. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is like that. It's a declaration of the kingdom of God and his indescribable good news for the world. And we should never stop sharing that or leaning into that or proclaiming that message. We have to declare and proclaim the gospel continuously. And here's why. It doesn't just naturally surface in our human systems. It's something that we have to cultivate and work towards and say, you know what? The spirit of God is in me and I have to proclaim it to the world. So here's the reality. There are many false gospels offering a false salvation. Here's the truth. If you don't know the true gospel, you're not going to know when a false gospel is presenting itself to you because it sounds really good. And you're going to lean in and say, oh, yeah, I like that. That's good. See, we have to know what the gospel says. See, false gospels offer false salvations, and they radically overpromise and underdeliver. Their fruit is slavery and not freedom. Here's what the salvation uh, gospel offers us is freedom and joy, and it's not about slavery. He came to meet the deepest longings of your heart and heal your soul. That way you could be fully satisfied only in and through him, through the gospel message. The gospel is about God and his plan, not our plan. It's about God and his plan. The greater story of redemption. And here's, here's the beauty of, of, the, of the message of the Bible is this. is We go on this journey from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And here's what God is doing. is He's painting this picture. He's putting get together this narrative of redeeming your life and my life and drawing us back to him. Why is that? Because that is why he came. That's why he gave us Jesus is to redeem our lives. We are not God. We're not. We're not God, and we can't earn salvation through self-improvement. And I can tell you this. I've tried. There was a time in my life that I, I used to purchase every self-improvement book at Barnes & Noble, and I would scour them and read them. And guess what happened? It didn't find me any inner peace. It didn't. There were good, good things, good practices, but it didn't bring me joy. The deep joy that only God can bring. See, salvation, we can't gain salvation through self accusation See, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the highest level of psychological development, and I've dove deep into that as well. But guess what? Here's the reality that you and I, we desperately need rescued. And the only one that can rescue us is Jesus through the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is substitutionary. See, Jesus bore the punishment of our sins through atonement. He took on our sin. That's why he went to the cross and laid down his life for you and I. It's not something that we can earn. It's not something that we can simply overcome. You see, it's, it's simply a free gift called grace. You know what separates the gospel from every other religion on the planet? It's grace. That's it. It's grace. It's not works. It's not you trying harder or doing better or forming a new habit. It's a surrender unto God of I am giving you my life. Thank you for substituting, substituting your life for mine. The gospel is holistic. 
It redeems our lives in order for us to live and operate in a redeemed community so that we can go and share with the world in our schools and we can live that out in our lives, in our workplaces, in our hobbies, in everything that we can do. That way we can see our broken world and our broken community redeemed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bad theology says this, I'm saved so I can leave here and go live up there. Like, like there's people I, I talk to all the time. It's like that, that's, that's the end game. Like that's all they're thinking about. Here's good theology. I've been redeemed in order to be an agent of redemption here and now. I've been redeemed so that I can be an agent of redemption here and now as we wait God's full redemption in our lives. That is why you're here, not just to go to heaven. Yes, that's great, but we've got to proclaim and bring the gospel message to here and now. It's a gospel of the kingdom. See, our ultimate goal is to bring Christ's lordship and God's reign to every place that we go and we live and we dwell in this life, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in your hobbies, in your sports, in everything that you do. We spent an entire year unpacking the kingdom of God. It was an incredible series that Pastor Matt took us through. See, this gospel is entrusted to us. God gives it to you and I as partners to proclaim and share. That's why we have to let the spirit of God rise up in in us because it's not going to go forth without us. We have to share the message. He entrusts it to you and I as partners with him and, and being empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's power made available by the Holy Spirit. Acts 1 talks about this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. When you, when salvation comes in your life, the Spirit of God comes in you, and you're able to go and proclaim the gospel message throughout, throughout the world. Wherever you go in this life, see, the gospel comes from God, and it's empowered and accomplished by the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gospel is a is it, it's a gospel of radical love. We've been talking about this for several weeks now. It reveals God's ultimate nature is love. There's no greater thing that we can do than love somebody else. It shows us just how far God will go to win us back to him. He's continually pursuing us to redeem us, to restore our lives We find this guy in the Gospels named Nicodemus, and he was an incredibly intelligent man. And he keeps coming to Jesus at night. Why was that? Because he was curious of what Jesus had to say. See, Nicodemus was a high-ranking official, incredibly knowledge in the Sanhedrin, And he had witnessed these undeniable miracles that Jesus had performed. And so he began to show up at night. Why was that? Because he didn't want anybody to see him. He didn't want anybody to see and and question, man, like, what are you doing hanging out with with this Jesus guy? You see, Nicodemus had some level of faith. And he had this acknowledgement that that Jesus was this rabbi and had this authority from God. But I I would imagine Nicodemus was having this question of, can you believe that this Jesus guy is actually the Savior? Is he the Messiah? Is he truly God in flesh? There's a difference between liking Jesus and agreeing with his message. Believing that he is Lord and God and Savior in the flesh. You see, one means that you can kind of pick and choose the things that you agree with. I've been there. I'm like, I I like that. That's good. Ooh, that, that's hard. Let's just park that. Let's park that over here. Because I don't want to deal with that right now. One means that you completely surrender and abandon your life unto God. Saying, God, I'm fully yours. 
I surrender unto you. See, Nicodemus was full of head knowledge. And I credit him that he was curious, that he was willing to come to Jesus and ask questions. He knew that Jesus was calling for some sort of transformation of a person's entire character. But how can you change after so many years of living a certain way? This is a challenge for every one of us. How can I change when this is what I've, I grew up with? This is what my mom and dad taught me. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. How do we change when we've lived that way for so long and we're essentially just deeply set in our ways? In John 3, we pick up the story. It says, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you're doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be, be born when they are old? And Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot encounter, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. And Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Flesh gives birth to, or sorry, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. Like he, he just couldn't wrap his mind around that because Jesus was saying something different than he had heard. He knew about God. He believed in God. But now he began to question. He's like, what, what are you talking about being born again? You see, Nicodemus was a devout Orthodox Jew. And he had presumed that his place in the kingdom was assured by virtue of his race and by his circumcision. Nicodemus was a leading religious professional, <laughs> just like we have professional athletes and you have masters of certain trades. Nicodemus was a professional religious Man, he was a Pharisee. He was a man of prestige and knowledge and ed education. He was a member of the of the ruling council, the, the Sanhedrin. In fact, I, I would imagine that there were few Jews in the entire city that night that could hold any a candle to Nicodemus's credentials. Yet Jesus tells him that you must be born again. There's something that you're lacking, Nicodemus. If Nicodemus couldn't inherit the promised kingdom by his credentials alone, what hope does anybody else have? That was a difficult thing for Nicodemus to realize, to grasp. But everyone is born of the flesh. But when we believe in the gospel and choose to let go of our lives, we experience this rebirth of the spirit of God in our lives. That's how God intended it. As he knew all along he was going to send this guy named Jesus to live and breathe on planet earth for you and I to be redeemed by the gospel we pick back up the story in John 3, 16, most quoted verse in the entire world. See it at every sports arena. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the good news that you and I have been redeemed and that we can live in God's kingdom and we can proclaim that news. And hopefully we can do that with, with the energy and the consistency that Paul did. Here's the radicalness of the gospel is how we get in. Nicodemus could not wrap his mind around that. The offense of the gospel is this, is who it lets in. It's everyone. It's offensive to us. What, what, is, that, what is that guy doing here? I shouldn't be allowed in here. It's for everybody. It's for all people. How will you and I respond to the gospel? I love that we find these three stories of these rich people in the Bible. One of them was Nicodemus. And we see that he was incredibly curious. He was in incredibly knowledgeable yet I don't know if he ever believed. You have the rich, young, young ruler. He had everything. Everything that you could ever imagine. And Jesus looks at him and he says, one last thing. I want you to go sell everything and then come follow me. It was too much for him. He's like, no, I can't do that. I can't give up my stuff. There's just no way. I like it too much. And then we have this guy named Zacchaeus, who we know who is a tax collector. He responds differently. Literally goes and sells everything to follow Jesus. So I'm walking away, I'm surrendering, I'm giving you my life. How will you respond? Will your faith in Jesus lead you to a complete surrender in him? To say nothing in this world matters. Nothing in this world matters but you. A complete surrender. Will we believe in the gospel message? Will we lean into it and radically let it shape our lives? You see, we have to say, God, with all my heart, with all my soul, and with all my mind, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to get caught up in the things of this world or these false gospels that proclaim what sound really good. And they're enticing. Because so I'm going to look to you only. And I'm going to surrender my life to you. The beauty of the gospel is this, is it gives us everything. But it also requires everything. It gives us everything, but it requires everything of you. Will you allow God to come in and completely transform your heart and your mind and soul and saying, God, I'm surrendering everything to you. That's what the gospel does. That's the story from Genesis to Revelation is God is trying to win you back, to redeem you, to let you know how much he loves you 
and he cares for you and that he wants to redeem your life fully no matter what you've believed yet up to this point. I want to encourage you to, to get this book. I promise you it'll be transformative to you. Honestly, we, we were talking about this and because uh, we, we'd written these kingdom, this kingdom vision book and they, we literally laid out the five foundations before this book was even published. Pastor Matt was like, man, if I could write a book, this would be it. Pick up this book. I promise you, it will encourage you. It will challenge you. I'm going to pray for us this morning. We're going to take communion together. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. This morning, maybe you're here and you simply have just never taken Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. I want to invite you to do that today as, as we take communion together. On the top of this cup, you'll find a really tasty wafer. They're not tasty at all. They're actually terrible. But thanks to COVID, this is how we're doing communion right now. What does that represent? It represents the body of Christ. That he came to redeem your life. That he came so that we could fully surrender our lives to him. Jesus, thank you for your good news. God, I thank you that you sent your one and only son to give up his life just for me, just for the people in this room this morning, the people that are sitting in the parking lot this morning, the people that are listening online. God, we thank you for sending your one and only son just for us. And this morning we pause to remember and say thank you. Let's take of the bread together. In the same way that he gave up his body, he shed his blood for us. For our redemption, for our salvation. The juice in the cup represents that. so thankful for that this morning. Let's partake together. <clears throat>